uh, good evening everyone and today we have a you know wonderful guest with us today on candid meena and his name is dr ankit shah now dr ankit shah is a research associate in iim ahmedabad and he is in the advisory board member of uh, gnlu legal incubation council he has appeared on uh, many mainstream uh, media news channels as well as the leading indian youtube uh, news channels and is an observer on geo economics and politics so uh, welcome uh, dr ankit ji to our show namaste namaste yeah so uh, friends uh, happy independence day it was the uh, 77th independence day today and uh, prime minister modi ji you know gave a very uh, good speech uh, and and he attacked the opposition and uh, you know he uh, talked about how bjp is very confident of returning to power in 2024 So, Dr. Ankit Ji, could you enlighten us as to you know Modi Ji gave a speech today, right? And could you just summarize mm-hmm. as to or what what are your thoughts about that? So, uh, this has been uh, Jai Dev Ji a historic speech uh, in the sense that we are talking about plans up to twenty forty seven. That is when our country becomes hundred years. So, um, and then the major highlights of the speech. not just that he charted out the contribution that has happened the growth that has happened in the last 9 years and how that reflects as a change from the uh, previous 60 65 plus years that we had seen the governance uh, in the country uh, the major highlights being uh, if you have noticed uh, the deshwasiyo word is being replaced by the word parivar jan so somewhere down the line he is talking about how important the family unit economics will be in the changing uh, global scenario going forward he's talking about that the world is going to look beyond the big cities so we are talking about those specific urban fiat dollar cities worldwide which we are seeing that they are facing dilution with the de-dollarization process that is going to speed up after the upcoming brics summit in south africa so uh, this entire theme of change in terms of new world order the financial reset which is approaching around the year 2025 because we have our elections around mid 2024 november 2024 would be somewhere us election and uk election expected around january 2025 so after that undoubtedly we are heading towards a big great financial reset of the world wherein you know we are shifting from a single country reserve currency to multiple country reserve currencies or operating currencies and not just that if by that time uh, fortunately if we see some brics currency coming up then january 2025 onwards we will see discussions on the reset coming so looking at that when he says that the world is going to look beyond the big cities uh, we the viewers need to know the background of how the big cities were created worldwide so with the power of endless printing of the reserve currency that the western world had over these decades what happened was uh, there was an individualism wave a feminism wave and a privacy etc kind of theories being floated uh, among the indian masses in the 50s 60s and 70s uh, that the westerners were you know panicking that this country is newly independent and if they go back with the continuous uh, self employment and entrepreneurship model uh, they will achieve back that 27% global gdp on an average contribution which will be giving a more than 100 1800 years that the subcontinent was giving uh, so they floated all these theories wherein you know people started asking rights from their parents brothers sisters uh, they broke the joint family corpus they took their share and came to this urban cities which we see right now um and handed over that entire savings and corpus to the companies and they themselves became jobbers so this this was the intent of uh, destroying the farming manufacturing and entrepreneurship model based on which this entire indian subcontinent was uh, so rich for about 1800 years so the same a british colonial method of converting entire society into jobbers uh, with a fake classroom format stuffing people into four walls uh, for 15 long years so that they do not know what market realities are about uh, this was being carried forward after pound being the single country reserve currency to now 
dollar being the single country reserve currency. So now when the prime minister says, Parivar Jan, um, you know, when this crisis has struck the West, uh, those children who are not able to pay those EMIs are coming back to parents' home in the West. So uh, the prime minister is hinting that the world is going to look beyond those big cities because as we see those uh, states, those fiat dollar states being created worldwide, be it London, be it Canberra, or be it, uh, you know, Toronto, or be it New York, Chicago, or California, the way uh, the commercial spaces are being emptied uh, and moving towards a regulated collapse, uh, you shouldn't be surprised some of the collateral damage we'd be seeing in our fiat dollar cities as well, who are dependent on NRI remittances, exports, and outsourcing projects. So uh, that is why the prime minister was hinting at a tier two and tier three cities, uh, the rise of those. And he's been clear about how small towns and villages are at the forefront of innovations. Now, the youth should make uh, most of these opportunities, startups and stuff like that. And he clearly told that Bharat is at a decisive turning point and has the strength to shape the new world order. Uh, and uh, over the years, if you look at all his speeches, yeah, you can clearly find out how Bharat is now, as a terminology, uh, phasing out India as a terminology. So the last three new laws which were introduced by the Home Minister uh, in the last parliamentary session that closed, uh, you know, Bhartiya Nyay Sahita and all. So officially, Bharat as a term is phasing out India as a term. So it's not just about the politics that the opposition parties have named themselves as India, but it is about the colonial baggage that we need to move, uh, sh shrug off and move forward to. So um, we we need we do not we are not obliged to be called or addressed by any names which the foreigners named us, be it the derivation of Indus civilization or the Indian Ocean. The fact of the matter is, it is they, they from outside looking at us, named us based on those geographical connotations because they were trying to search us uh, as a land of treasure. So, so when, when we say chon, sone ki chidiya, so that chidiya connotation is, comes from this negative intent which they had Okay, uh, you know, we can capture this one. So, uh, you know, uh, you, you shouldn't be surprised about the kind of changes that are coming in that officially Bharat is coming back uh, in terms of not just terminology, but in terms of geopolitics, you will find that most of these geographies, uh, be it uh, uh, the Middle East or the Central Asian countries, uh, we, we all understand those terminology when we say, uh, Tajikistan, that Stan, Stan comes from Stan, right? So, and, and not just even if you look at the Middle East, you know that the Kaaba of the Saudi Arabia goes the same line and length as the Somnath of Gujarat and the Temple Mount of Jerusalem goes in the same line and length as Kedarnath. So I've been talking this uh, on several uh, channels that we need to ultimately because this de-dollarization process will result into a decolonization wave wherein you know now you see that the cbse has approved 24 regional 22 regional languages so because we were giving 27 percent to the world gdp without english language and without the reserve currency format so the viewers need to know this fact that there wasn't any english language it's an imposition colonial imposition and since they had colonies worldwide it became the operating language now that we move towards a financial reset where the West is not going to have a single country reserve currency. The invoicing is not going to be in those currencies. Uh, the referencing of valuation of the invoices are not going to be in those currencies. What that ultimately means is that the Western clients will not be any more able to afford Asian services, even if you want to sell, right? That is the direction we are heading, uh, which means uh, that ultimately we will have to come back to the same family unit entrepreneurship model under the Sanatan economics format, which I say. So these are the kind of big geopolitical changes. This three decades have, as the prime minister rightly put out, has come out of thousand after thousand years, this next three decades, that window of opportunity has opened up. So what is the new world order as of now? Like uh, which are the countries, you know, which will be 
powerful as in like uh, you know us is undergoing inflation right inflation is high in us and uh, you think that uh, you know dollar can come down in value at uh, some point of time in the future hmm. so uh, you know uh, 2021 i predicted that the us dollar would be 3 rupees by 2029 uh, and looking at the factors that i see at this point in time i i would not wish to revise that prediction so uh, 3 inr is what i'm predicting for 2029 uh, and uh, uh, See, there are three parts in the valuation of any currency. One is uh, the natural resources that the country has if the currency is to be pegged. Second portion is the demand as a trading currency. And third portion is the demand as the savings currency. Now, you've got to understand, say, if I'm to give you a story, five, five friends went to a hotel uh, and they said, uh, you know, the U.S. friend is saying, let's pay the hotel bill in U.S. dollar. The remaining four friends are saying, okay, iske paas hai, let him pay. So people are enjoying. Then the U.S. friend says, whatever trade that we do between us, let us do in U.S. dollar. Everyone says yes. So 180 plus nations destroyed the demand for their own currencies and artificially propped up the U.S. dollar. Now the U.S. friend says, um, Let's do one thing if, uh, you know, that you need to now uh, trade and earn the dollars first to do any kind of trade. Uh, two of the friends were like, uh, we are working slogging 12, 14 hours. We're still not able to match up to the requirements to earn the US dollar. Because as you see, 180 plus nations have propped up the valuation because of the demand. Uh, now the US says, I'm going to set up institutions where you can go and take the US dollar loans. So that is how you see IMF, World Bank and United Nations being set up after the Second World War. Uh, after that, what happens is the friend is uh, two for two of the friends realize that this is now a total a mafia kind of a loot that is going on. Um, so one of the friends says, I'm going to de-dollarize. And suddenly the US friend says, looks like this guy got weapons of mass destruction so that is what happens with him the other guy says uh, i'm going to form an african union and i'm going to peg the currency with gold and let us trade outside the us dollar now that guy uh, happened to be gaddafi so you understand the fate of both of them now what happens is uh, the us guy says that there's still this country which uh, has a lot of brain so let me unpack the dollar from the gold standard in 1971, uh, offer fiat dollar salary levels to the brains, and let me take the brain to the US. So that is what happens with the 1971 fiat dollar birth. Uh, birth of the entire services sector and the tech sector happens with the fiat dollar. The brains are taken there, but we still have data which says about 1,500 scientists being killed and not a single case where we found out a Chinese or a Russian hand. So you understand what has happened. So a tech sector is being created with the fiat dollar, uh, entire talent taken over there by destroying manufacturing, farming, food processing, logistics, and all those core sectors. Uh, and they being handed over coolie jobs so not just this sector uh, you know gets any kind of a brain output the other sectors also being destroyed still not satisfied uh, they did this individualism feminism wave broke the families uh, uh, made them hand over the corpus and turned in everybody into jobbers and that is how this uh, fiat dollar cities were created uh, mumbai pune hyderabad chennai and bangalore with nri remittances exports and uh, outsourcing projects uh, still not satisfied, they said we are going to fund uh, the startups, startup ecosystem from the Wall Street Finance directly from the Federal Reserve printing machine. Um, uh, uh, let those e commerce portals sell below cost. So you see uh, an onslaught of e commerce portals who start selling below cost. So a product is 120 rupees being sold for 100 rupees, and the customers are surprised how this happens. And you see all of the offline trade shops being shutting down one after the other. So this this entire gimmick of 
uh, you know, a kind of deceit and cheat of continuously printing the currencies and funding the NGOs and conversion activities uh, and missionarization and radicalization process, all happening directly from the endless printing of the currency, enjoying the reserve currency status. So this is all went on and on, on and on. Uh, 1979, this guy goes to Deng Xiaoping, goes to President Carter. He's been told, uh, you know, you want technology from us, you uh, finish off your own consumption. This guy comes back and imposes a single child policy in China, uh, gets the technology and becomes the manufacturing giant that it is. Uh, similarly, 1973, Kissinger goes to Saudi Arabia. They sign an oil for security program, entire crude oil to be sold in dollars uh, to artificially prop up again, as I said, the dollarization of the world. Uh, uh, and you see how uh, the radicalization of Middle East and the Indian subcontinent starts. I mean, prior to 1971, there was not a single black burqa in the Indian subcontinent. Prior to the fiat dollar of 1971, I'm repeating, there was not a single black burqa in this country. Prior to 1973 petrodollar, there were not a single city in India where the highways of both the sides purchased by a Muslim community. So you understand how dollarization went ahead along with radicalization and missionarization with those NGOs, missionaries and protest finance coming out endlessly printed from the Western countries. So this is how the dollarization of the world has happened. Uh, uh, they just pass on their lifestyle bills to the rest of the world because the rest of the world has to do all trade in the US dollar. Uh, by by 90s, the entire reserve currency bubble gets accumulated in the tech sector uh, in the US. But the allies come up with the first ever de-dollarization of the world by launching the euro currency. And now the United States is panicked. So what they do is um, they come up with this gimmick of mixing commercial banking with investment banking in the US. Uh, they remove the requirements, uh, regulations of the keeping both the banking separate. So now the banks could pay, play speculative trade with the people's money uh, just to counter this de-dollarization move. Then they drag the European Union in the Yugoslavia conflict to bring the value of euro down. And by the time European allies realize this, um, they say now we know more power cover savings in the US Treasury. And with that, the entire bubble, reserve currency bubble accumulated in the tech sector crashes in what we call as the dot-com crash of 2002, losing 78% valuations of the tech sector. This was the first ever de-dollarization in the world, wherein the tech sector lost 78% valuations. So currently what we are seeing is the final de-dollarization process, which means the tech sector is <laughs> it's just going to get done with right so uh, these are the changes that are happening now uh, since the european union said that we are no more going to park our savings uh, what happens is uh, china is taken to the wto membership and given all the benefits of wto uh, and in return the chinese communist party promises to park their savings in the u.s treasury in place of the european allies so this is how china became the manufacturing giant that it has become so it wasn't the stealing of that it was pur on purpose passing on of technology to make china the giant that it became now because of the endless printing of currency that they have already destroyed uh, the family institution in the west with as i say adam smith causes 60 percent divorces and Karl Marx causes 60% slave population oh, under state control. So, uh, you know, the Adam Smith capitalism, extreme capitalism, and with this debt-based model of endless printing of currency, uh, well, many of those loans were now not being repaid, which caused the 2008 crisis. Uh, this time, when the United States printed dollars to bring Americans out of that crisis, uh, passed on massive inflation across the world, and many of the Middle East governments uh, started falling because of food inflation in what we call as the Arab Spring of 2011. 
this is the first time the Middle East realizes the heavy cost of continuing with the US dollar as the reserve currency, uh, that they lost about 50% of their crude oil wealth in radicalizing India and Middle East just to keep the US dollar going. Uh, and now only 50% crude oil stock is left and they do not know any economics because of the religious doctrine that they have. And now they start panicking. Now they are in search for an international partner who would help in the de-radicalization and de-dollarization process. And this is the exact opportune moment the prime minister sits in the government in India. So they see the prime minister as a partner uh, for de-radicalizing and de-dollarizing the world. So the first visit comes of uh, the prince of UAE, the crown prince comes. Uh, and when he comes, he is shocked to see the entire country uh, talking about the narrative of uh, intolerant. Just like Guj all Gujaratis were intolerant that they voted BJP to power for a decade plus, probably entire India became intolerant that moment. Uh, and when the UAE prince sees this, he goes back to UAE and declares a tolerance ministry for UAE. Uh, so now the, the arithmetic here is that we are going to solve the radicalization problem at the point of origin in the Middle East. Um, so now the prince sends uh, 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 a prince to 2008, I think 2018 early to the Akshardhan temple in Delhi to visit and find out how uh, yoga, Ayurveda and Mandirs can help de-radicalize the entire Gulf. So the prince uh, attends the Akshardham temple and talks with the priests and stuff like that. And with that, the entire de-radicalization process of the Middle East begins. So, uh, and along with that, the de-dollarization process as well. Because, uh, you know, in order to shift the reserve currency, what you need to do is the collection of physical gold. Uh, the prime minister first tries to collect the gold from the indian citizens with a de with a monetization of gold scheme but that fails because <laughs> the gold is sanatan and you know indians won't part with gold so that scheme failed so he thought let me de-dollarize this way but then uh, that didn't work and then uh, uh, he came up with this idea of let's then let's collect gold from the west so all the brazil russia india china uh, all the countries of the BRICS and the global south that is Middle East, all central banks start collecting physical gold from the West. Uh, this is how the de-dollarization process started. And India said, now no more we are going go, to go for multilateral trade pacts because if we do that, the dollar sits by default as a transaction currency. So India says no more. We are, each country will line up. They will come. We will negotiate. And we'll enter into individual free trade agreements with all the countries. And then the prime minister moves fast with the rupee and the UPI cards to uh, de-dollarize the world. So step by step, I mean, Russia and China has no clue that it's India who's leading the de-dollarization process. They just know one thing, and that is that the physical gold needs to be collected. They had no clue that India went so far. So uh, this is how the entire de-dollarization process uh, has started now. And we see that the BRICS summit is uh, coming up and uh, there's a possible of a new payment system alternative of the SWIFT and uh, a, a committee would be formed for discussing a technical committee of the BRICS nations to be formed to discuss the possibility of a common currency replacing the US dollar. And we already, as we see just yesterday with the, the transaction completed, of crude oil beyond the US dollar for the first time. So we already so, made a statement. We already made a statement that we are no more a financial colony of the United States yesterday. So yes, uh, yes. This so, is sorry. How, uh, yeah. So how do you see uh, India's future going ahead? Well, uh, see this de this decade is uh, this decade has is going to be a tumultuous one. Because um, the one, one fact that we know that all these Western com companies, uh, which understand and as I see that they have selected India as the next global power, they are going to shift and settle operations in India. I mean, every meeting that a Western biggie you saw in the prime minister's office, they go with the India business head along. 
uh, and then when they come out they come up with india plans of investments and shifting of operations from the west uh, they go back home they lay off people and shut down offices in the west so it is very clear that by the end of this decade not just that all these big western companies are going to shift and settle in india as i say that uh, the top management is going to convert from a white to an nri and then from an nri to a resident indian by 2030 of all these big companies this is a change big geopolitical geoeconomic change that we are going to see through this decade uh, so that's a big change coming in and i see the gift city of gandhinagar as the new mini world bank of the world uh, wherein um, not just these biggies are going to come and put up their headquarters i believe they are listing in the gift city exchange uh, stock exchange particularly because they know that they are going to face a wipeout in the financial reset in the west so and the prime minister being very clear in his speech at france addressing the diaspora that don't tell that i didn't tell you that this is the point in time if you want to invest in india and also start exploring the the sectors you are working in in india so i think he's been unequivocal about the big uh, financial reset which is coming and not just that we already saw how even the external affairs minister was talking about in one of the podcast that uh, visa is not going to be an issue because uh, the world that we are moving in is going to be to and fro you, you complete the work and you can come back that kind of liquid it's going to be so i think everybody is hinting at the great financial reset which is going to come in some months from now after the elections so uh, in terms of bharat what we saw what we see as 2047 uh, some of the predictions which are, i've already put out which is uae is going to be the first hindu country saudi arabia is going to be a jewish majority and iran is going to be a christian majority uh, by 2040 you can see all of these changes uh, not just that in terms of the net security provision from Saudi Arabia to Laos, Cambodia is the greater Indian subcontinent, which we can say, with Ayodhya as a center, uh, central node for the Mandir ecosystem, uh, seamlessly connecting from Saudi Arabia to Laos, Cambodia, all the Mandir ecosystems. The first one, most probably, I see is uh, Mithila Ayodhya Lanka corridor. That could be the first one to be built in this uh, Sanatan economics model. Uh, in terms of uh, defense and security, what I am seeing is, uh, you know, the UAE Air Force uh, would be almost subsumed or, uh, you know, becoming like an interoperable with the Indian Air Force because they have Rafales and they are going to have, they have Mirages. We also have Rafales and Mirages probably for the same reason of, uh, you know, interoperability because after the financial reset, us will be no more in the global policing role which means the entire defense capex need to be shared by the indian subcontinent together so i believe uae air force becomes completely interoperable with the indian air force saudi combat forces training in india and becoming interoperable and iranian navy becoming uh, interoperable with the indian navy on this side and on the other side as well you will see the mandir revivals we are already seeing how the Cambodian king visited India after 60 years. Uh, so the revival of Mandir ecosystem in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Myanmar is something which is naturally going to flow. So we are seeing, and this parliament, as, as we know, is not made for just for India. It is for the Indian subcontinent altogether, which is why you don't have the central hall in this new parliament. Because previously, the foreign visitors used to address from there. But when somebody is coming from the Indian subcontinent, from Saudi Arabia to Laos, Cambodia, you don't have any central hall, which means they will have to sit in the Lok Sabha, and which which justifies the role that we have in the Indian subcontinent. So, so what, these are the kind is, of sorry. What will happen to China and Russia in the future? Like, is there any prediction? Well, um, the Chinese economy, uh, thanks to the U.S. dollar, the Xi Jinping has realized uh, that. They are going to face a four to one crisis from 2029, which means four parents, two, uh, four grandparents, two parents, and earning person only one. And that guy does not get a woman to marry. So I see about 40 million Chinese men without any woman to marry from 2029 onwards. So that's a kind of thanks to the dollar and the single and, child policies. So they have become agents before being rich. 
they have become aged before being rich. Uh, and Xi Jinping realizes that after doing four decades of manufacturing for the entire world, uh, what he made in profits is only three trillions, three trillions in reserves. And the United States printed about 14 trillion dollars in just the last three years and distributed to Americans for free. So he is on board this de-dollarization process because of this. He understands this. And he's okay with the massive unemployment and the uh, accumulated reserve currency bubble bursting in its real estate. He's okay to take that pain. So he's aligned on this process as long as Russia is concerned. See, you have to understand why, why there is a moment of new applications in BRICS. Because BRICS was here for more than a decade. Nobody was interested. All right. Uh, if somebody wants to transact in fiat dollar or fiat currency, all the currencies are fiat. There's no need for uh, joining BRICS, right? So you got to understand that all these new applications are coming because they want a new currency which is pegged with some finite commodity like gold or something like that, right? Because understand, after 25, 30 years, these guys do not have the crude oil free stock coming out from the soil. What they will do? So they want savings in a currency which is backed by some actual asset, which is why they are applying for BRICS. So the Indian rupee has reserve currency features, not all, but compared to ruble and yuan, the Indian rupee has reserve currency features, which is savings currency demand, but it does not have the trade and manufacturing of that level to back it up that India can bring a unipolar world. That's not possible at this point, to be honest. Yuan as a currency has trading currency features, but it does not have savings currency features. All right. Uh, because it has the trade might to back it up, but it does not have the savings currency feature transparency, which is required for countries to hold Yuan as a reserve currency. Ruble does not have reserve currency features, neither has trading currency features, but Russia is the richest country in terms of natural resources, commodities. So if currency is to be pegged with natural commodities, then Russia is the richest country in the world at this point in time and will rich, remain rich till 2047 because, uh, you know, by, by next mid, mid decade next year, uh, you'll have those Arctic melting and the entire treasure coming up and the new sea lanes under the Russian forces dominance. So in terms of commodities, it is very rich, but the currency does not have reserve currency feature or a trading currency feature. So since none of the three can bring about a unipolar world, I think they compromised and moved toward the BRICS block for the same reason. So th this is the these are the kind of changes which are coming in. And how, how do you see the next year uh, Lok Sabha election? You think BJP well, will Well, I have, I have, I have uh, last year itself, I predicted 350 seats plus. Uh, and I think as of now, I don't see any change in that prediction. So uh, Modi ji will come with a huge number next year. Uh, that's your yeah, prediction. Yeah, 350 plus seats. Yeah. So how do you see the Manipur uh, situation? Um, really well uh, th there are two three factors here one we already know about the drug uh, the cookie community uh, tango with the drug cartel uh, and uh, you know last some months or years there's been a crackdown on that so the frustration was already building up among that in that community uh, plus there were, uh, you know, allegiances to uh, linkages with some of the Myanmar elements involved in this. Uh, and the missionary funding was going on in the Northeast for decades now from countries like Norway and New Zealand a lot. They had a big role in the missionary funding uh, and the activities. So uh, the clash was obviously uh, supposed to happen whenever the cleanup happens. Uh, those who are going to be victims are going to, uh, you know, react back. So uh, as long as Manipur is concerned, it's the land, the soil, the language, everything belongs to the Meite community. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And when they saw that this kind of infringement and uh, this kind of domination that they have been facing, 
the clash was imminent uh, what happened that we see but over a period of time i mean uh, i've been recommending this uh, two uh, bills one is confiscation of international properties bill and second was uh, what i say is modernization of religious teaching bill because ultimately you want all those uh, all those premises be it religious be it commercial or residence where you find any kind of illegal weapon storage uh, international content or international uh, speeches or you see uh, that uh, that premises being used to indoctrinate uh, young impressionable minds uh, under whatever the pretext i think those kind of pr premises need to be uh, put under security audit and then if, if it is proven then those need to be confiscated and i'm very happy that the new the new three laws that has come up covers this kind of stuff so that's already covered but what i'm rooting for is modernization of religious teaching bill because i believe that once this financial reset hits uh the job model which was imposed by the britishers britishers all across the colonies is going to take a huge hit uh, which means the, i'm talking about the services sector jobs which means that the education sector is going to be asked after a few months that if there are not good job numbers how do you justify stuffing people into this 15 years uh, classroom and why are exactly are you testing memory when memory has no role in the market uh, in making money so uh, i think this uh, this colonial idea of the britishers to feminize men by testing memory uh, unnecessarily uh, for the 15 long years so that when they come out they have no clue about market uh, and they can't question the british uh, or have thoughts of independence and stuff like that that is what the motive was unfortunately became the education sector in the world because they had colonies i think after this de-dollarization process the education sector will need to have a big revamp because no piece of certificate would then guarantee you uh, something like 15 20 years which you thought i mean the, the generations till now think that they should have guarantee of work so i do believe that the world is moving back towards the family unit entrepreneurship model um, after the it sector layoffs you will see some of the banking sector layoffs uh, you will see some cons consultancy sector layoffs the entire services sector will take some or the other kind of hit not just that the real estate of uh, all these fiat dollar cities be it new york california chicago london Bangalore, Pune, Hyderabad, Mumbai, Chennai, all these fiat dollar cities uh, where, uh, because this were NRI remittances and outsourcing projects, they are also going to dilute a bit. So I believe that we need to get rid of the British classroom format. We need to come back. Before the British classroom format, we had this uh, Gurukul skill-based education model. So we need to come back to that. And we also want uh, those religions which are uh, practicing hardcore religious doctrine, which has uh, which does not cover contemporary subjects and skill sets. They also need to be brought uh, into the mainstream because you don't want a population which is uh, economically purposely being kept handicapped and then they being handed over stones, right? Uh, it's it's not just like for no reason that the stones go up to third floor, right? It doesn't go into your building or my building. It goes into specific buildings. So I believe that modernization of religious teaching is required to give pathway to the gurukuls, pathway to this uh, religious madrasa education, to a higher education so that the employment is possible and assimilating in the mainstream is possible by sensitizing the content of the syllabus uh, and making uh, regulations for the qualification of the teachers who are, who are teaching the skills and giving them a modern pathway for employment as well so uh, taking a positive intent out of this this is something that we need uh, modernization of religious teaching bill uh, because if, if you remove that uh, influence 
uh, uh, imposition of uh, you know sixth or seventh century uh, lifestyle habits from the community's uh, uh, you know routine life i think more more or less the problems that we are facing would get solved uh, understand one thing um, when we talk about national security uh, shastras what we call as shastras that is you know the, the curriculum or the information outlets uh, that that is for your internal security because uh, you know if if that shastras or the curriculum or the information outlets are not nationalist then unfortunately you will have to use shastra for internal security uh, in ancient india shastra was for internal security and shastra was for external security but if you fail in the curriculum and history then unfortunately you will have to use shastra for internal security which is which is a wrong way to go about so i think that ancient bharat model needs to be come needs to come back of gurukul based education skill based education model so there's a lot of uh, anti indian forces be it like um, you know china be it uh, the isi uh, be it george soros so how do you see all these uh, you know india countering all these people well uh, you know when we talk about this kind of uh, funding that happens every every foreign contract or a foreign uh, you know contribution actually needs to go through a, a national security provision or a filter kind of a thing right so that is something which hasn't happened which is why see what globalization does is it removes the security of the physical border so when you are able to talk to the enemy's population bypassing the enemy's leadership it is a lethal weapon of war so when the the violence that we saw in mewat and nu region uh, we understood that there were lot many of pakistani social media handles who were able to pass on information fake information instigate and stuff like that so this is what happens uh, if if the enemy forces are able to talk to your population bypassing the government directly talk to them Uh, then it is a lethal weapon of war so you need to understand where you need to install the control points in this entire system be it, be it into the information technology or be it uh, the transactional warfare because uh, these kind of international elements would use even the economic transactions to uh, pursue these objectives so uh, you won't be surprised if you find that Uh, if almond is being sold by a you know a chinese or a pakistani trader to a kashmiri for 200 rupees a kilo and this guy then sells for 800 rupees a kilo and that and the remaining 600 goes for terror finance so uh, you need to understand that this kind of modus operandi uh, those tourist operators uh, portals being used where you know the entire tour is booked uh, the amount is paid online and then the tour is cancelled and the forfeited amount by the portal diverted towards protest finance so all these international foreign elements are going to play muck around if you open the doors if your doors are not secure so uh, you will require that kind of a national security apparatus that uh, you know uh, closes all these doors so what do you see uh, cryptocurrency playing a big role in these uh, terrorist funding and everything yes so there's a big role of uh, uh, this bit uh, you know this bitcoin. bitcoin and this kind of payment systems private cryptos which is why i believe that after the financial reset there will be a big clamp down on uh, private cryptos for at least that particular role which is a legal tender of money in terms of payment i think that will not be allowed after the financial reset so uh, that is very clear Uh, but until the financial reset comes all this private cryptos will go up particularly because they do not have the western countries do not have as much physical gold to offer because whenever people doubt the financial system they rush and uh, collect physical gold and since the western countries do not have as much physical gold uh, when the panic strikes they are going to fool the people saying uh, private crypto is a good place to go so uh, temporary it might shoot up for next one one and a half years but when the financial reset comes 
those governments western governments are going to mandate mandate those cbdc central bank digital currency and they will put a ban or whatever the checkpoints they will put on this uh, private cryptos as a legal tender of money so going forward the problem with the private cryptos is twofold one is it does not have jurisdiction so tomorrow if my screen shows from 50000 it becomes 5000 i don't know where should i go to get that issue addressed i don't know where who will i complain right which means that it cannot be a, a stable store of value if the valuation is changing by words of mouth right uh, second thing, as I said, the central banks are not going to leave that role of regulating the currency because currency is what the state borders stand on. So I don't think they're going to, not even the leaders will allow the central banks to leave that control of regulating currency because otherwise all the schemes that they declare come out of that printing by the central banks. So uh, I don't think either the politicians are going to allow it or the central banks uh, and anyways, even the people do not have any jurisdiction where, where to address the problem if there's a problem. Yes. So how do you see uh, the Russian-Ukraine war? Will it, uh, you know, keep on going to Poland or something? Do you see that? Or, uh, well, you know, yeah. uh, you know the, the conflict, as I've been speaking since 2020, 2020 I predicted it already uh, in November 21 that it is coming. And then in February, I said the exact week that this is the week it's going to start. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it as a de-dollarization script uh, wherein um, the, the EU economies and currencies are being purposely being drowned so that the US dollar can survive some value. That is exactly what I look at it as, which means that it, it is going to drag until the financial crisis begins in the West because they need some bakra out of Putin and Xi Jinping to blame someone for the financial crisis which is going to come. If if the Western alliance wanted to stop the de-dollarization process, then they would not have gone for attacking Ukraine. They would, they would have selected Saudi Arabia, UAE or some that kind of a country. But the very fact that they could not, uh, uh, you know, that they decided that let's Ally, let's uh, let's kill our allies rather than facing a nuclear Russia or a nuclear China. So I think they're almost uh, a big chunk of their governance aligned on this de-dollarization process because they understand that they, are, they now have 33 trillions of debts. And if they want to clean that uh, slate of debt clean, uh, the only method is the financial reset. Because it's not possible to wipe off that massive mountain of debt without devaluation of the dollar. So even if Asia wants to export and give these goods and services to the West, uh, they have no chance because the currency is going to devalue. Right. So that is what it is. And what do you think of the COVID, um, you know, uh, pandemic? Was it a part of the de-dollarization? Do you think? Well, uh, I would not say it's as a part of de-dollarization, but I would certainly see it as an attempt made to bring down all the strong governments worldwide. And then you already understand that the private sector, that extreme capitalism won't lose that opportunity of making money, right? So I think it wasn't, uh, the origin might not be extreme capitalism, but on the path, they aligned with this COVID spread uh, just to uh, make money out of it. Uh, but the intent was to bring down all the strong governments worldwide. That was something which was very much visible. Because in the West, that they have already destroyed the family institution with the endless printing of currency. Uh, the wife's role is uh, the husband's role, the parent's role, the son's role. Everything is the US dollar, right? The parents would kick the kids out uh, at the age of 15, 16, because the state is going to take care of their Medicaid and from the printing machine. And the kids are going to get, you know, zero, one percent uh, loans. So they would also start their life. They also, they said, go to hell to their parents. So basically, they destroyed the family institution with this endless printing of currency. And now they are going to face this financial reset. Uh, and then they are going to be left wondering 
a wide their population to, does not have any kind of productivity they were just printing currency and consuming what the east produces from underwear to hair dye to carpet to jeans everything comes from outside so how do you see the future of pakistan and isi well uh, see the only alliance that i see in terms of geopolitics in the last 100 years was us deep state uh note that i didn't say us government us deep state uk government pakistan army and the chinese communist party according to me this was the only alliance there was no nato there was no eu there was no uh, quad there is absolutely nothing right this was the only alliance now after balakot since there wasn't any response from the pakistan army in terms of launching a war uh, that that faction got neutralized now the second was the chinese communist party since xi jinping as i said realized after working for 40 years they became aged before being reach because of the us dollar and then, then he is aligned to the de-dollarization process he removed the only two pro exports guys who were linked with the us deep state in the politburo Uh, Wang Yong and Li Keqiang. So both of them pro exports were removed. Now the entire Politburo is anti exports. Okay, so uh, the CCP now became a Xi Jinping party. So from this alliance of last hundred years, two elements got knocked off. UK government now does not have any geopolitical weightage in terms of uh, what it is facing, in terms of uh, the financial problems that. you know since january 2022 none of the allies have parked their savings in the us treasury which is which means every currency that the us and the european union prints the inflation passes on to their own people which they were passing on to the rest of the world since the last 50 years so now they are not able to pass on to the rest of the world so uh, which is why the uk economy is also is in trouble uh, now the only part leave, left is the us deep state which has already picked india as the next power and started shifting the operations so when we say deep state uh, this deep state is the same aristocrat family legacy somebody say illuminati somebody would say some other word committee of 300 committee of 300 whatever different different terminology but basically they dump a country as soon as the interest expense crosses the defense spending so when in uk when the uk interest expense crossed the defense spending they dumped the uk and selected us now us is in that position interest expense has crossed the defense spending they dumped us and now selected india that's what it is so what is george soros is he part of the deep state you think or is he well of course of course he is linked to the U, uh, the us deep state uh, and i believe that uh, the only problem with one faction of the deep state is that not that they have already selected india as the next power to be built uh, the only problem the f- one part of the faction has according to me is uh, racism they have this white racism and they are not okay with a brown guy uh, sitting on top of their head so uh, they have selected india but this is the mental tussle that they are facing right now yeah so how do you see uh, india russia relations in the future well uh, i believe that india russia will go move ahead with a lot of non defense stuff going forward uh, and a lot of defense stuff will now will be mainly with the west so this tech transfer and stuff will come to india the production would be in india and then exports of this arms will happen from india but Russia's uh, portion in the defense deals would now gradually reduce, and the non-defense because see understand uh, previously US was the global power, so it could consume everything. Uh, you didn't had as much defense trade with them, and Russia was a poor country. After the financial reset, it is the positions have flipped. <laughs> now Russia has. a lot of natural resources with which the currency is going to be pegged which means the russian purchasing power will be highest which means non defense trade are going to be with russia and the defense trade is going to be with us that's the flip which has happened 
okay the role has completely flipped between the two so more and more people to people and business ties manufacturing industrialization and stuff like that with russia so i will not be surprised in a few years if russia is being declared a reciprocating territory uh, which the status uae also has which means a lot of legal frameworks will also match something which is given a verdict over here will be uh, treated as a verdict in the legal framework there as well a lot of a lot many uh, you know regulations will be tweaked in russia for the indian citizens be it for education staying or uh, for investment purpose so that ties are going to be more and more people to people the societies both of them societies are going to liberate a lot because the chinese communist party when it does not require a pro export model what that translates into is liberalizing the society right uh, and a lot and a lot of manufacturing which causes exploitation uh, cheap labor and ex, uh, pollution uh, more exploitation of natural resources now that burden will shift to the west so us has already started shifting a lot of manufacturing to mexico and canada from china so uh, this is now the pollution will also shift to the west so yeah one last question uh, how do you see artificial intelligence um, is it a like gift or do you see it uh, taking away many uh, traditional jobs right in the market mm -hmm. see um, uh, when we talk about the four factors of production men machine the main four men machine market and money now the men factor of production as for as far as uh, you know sanatan economics model is concerned i believe that man factor of production should be at the core which means the rest of the factors of production are supposed to complement the man factor of production not compete with the man factor of production now with a country which has this big a population if we allow that kind of an adam smith extreme capitalism of the benefits of division of labor where we take the machine factor of production on our head and reduce the head counts and the working understand whenever there is uh, a lot of exploitation by a capitalist then then you will have a karl marx born asking for freebies okay so so when adam smith came with this capitalism model uh, talking about benefits of division of labor and passed on the 90% wealth of the nation in the hands of 5% industrialist then after that exploitation karl marx was born asking for freebies saying kya when you have already done the exploitation of the society now give me for free all right so i don't think uh, we should go either of the extremes uh, we should keep man factor of production as, at the core uh, and uh, you know in the next book which is the sanatan economics model i am coming up with new kind of indexes where you know the machine factor of production also needs to be remain in a particular uh, indexes and formulas it should remain in that healthy level so i think that that is something that we need to uh, work on in future yeah so is there anything else you would like to add uh, ankit ji um well i think uh, 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 in the south specific i witness because you know gujarati and marwadi families Uh, the kid already knows from class one that what is going on is totally stupid. So you know, by the age of twenty, they have two three shops of their own. So I believe that uh, the 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 Western belt maintained that Sanatan family unit entrepreneurship model. Uh, the kind of changes that are coming in in terms of this de-dollarization process, uh, I believe that the it's the responsibility of the parents in South India. uh to abs to help those kids absorb the shock that would come with the de-dollarization process because you know i've been handling some of the cases from bangalore where you know the salary is coming down from 1.5 crore to 30 lakhs so you you can understand the uh, you know the mental disturbance that it causes so i think it's a parents responsibility to, to bring the children back home let them stay with the family members and you know this is all just you know the it sector was actually uh, born out of that fiat dollar you can't do anything about it that they are not being will be able to pay you now how do you expect anybody to any do anything about it 
when the payers are not going to be able to pay. Okay. So nobody can do anything about it. But we need to give over a period of time, we need to give uh, that kind of atmosphere at home where parents allow their kids to fail. Let them try some business idea, let them fail. Uh, understand stock market capitalization is a proof that the parents uh, do not trust their own child to park their investments in, right? The stock market capitalization is a proof that the classroom format has totally failed and collapsed, right? So when the parents are investing outside in companies instead of their own kids, what does it say about the education format, right? So we need to come back to the that skill-based education model where the Gurukul's uh, skill-based uh, setup was there. And, uh, you know, help our kids uh, go for those kind of opportunities of entrepreneurship. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Ankit Ji, for, uh, you know, this wonderful session. And we will, uh, you know, hope you join us in few other future sessions on uh, dif different topics. Sure. Thank Jai you. Thank you, Jai. Jai.